Welcome you all again. So thank you so much, Maharaji, for the wonderful insights and the learnings that you've been getting from two of your sessions. Um, so today's the second part is titled Practices for Self-Realization. It is indeed our deepest honor, gratitude, and real joy to have Swami Sarvapyananda Ji with us celebrating uh, Vedanta Center's uh, Vedanta Center of Greater Austin's 10th anniversary. Uh, truly, his uh, sessions are not only inspiring and motivational, but what I really find is very practical. He gives us these golden nuggets as key takeaways that we can apply in our day-to-day -day lives and helps us to understand such deep and uh, dense concepts. So I just want to take a few seconds to kind of, as you all heard from Anand Ankalji yesterday about the journey of Vedanta Center, uh, really want to thank you all for all the support and encouragement that you've been giving our kids to run up one of our key services, the homeless service. Uh, the kids have been running this for almost seven plus years and we've been delivering care packages to the homeless in Austin. And during the COVID times, although it was a challenge for us since we do it physically, the kids found innovative ways of reaching out and we built collaboration with the local nonprofit organizations like Front Steps and Round Rock, uh, food pantry to reach out to greater, uh, larger number of people. And we also reached out to the elderly in the nursing homes and were able to deliver uh, care cards to them. So I just want to extend my humble thanks and look forward to your continued support. And welcome Swamiji for this session, for another very insightful session. Just a key note, uh, kindly hold on to your seats till the session is over as Swamiji leaves the room. And also please, Remember to take your box of light, light refreshments after today's session. With my deepest, deepest regards, Pranam, Swami to welcome. Just for a minute, I found it beneficial to chant OM. Um, so if you feel like you can join me, join me at your own pace. Don't start and end when I'm starting and ending. You, you do it at your own pace, I will do it at my own pace for a couple of minutes. So there is uh, this rolling waves of OM in the room. Sometimes in between you can sit quietly and enjoy the vibrations of OM. So but just for a couple of minutes. Right, the whole of the Indian tradition. I mean, all of Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism and Sikhism, oh, is the greatest mantra. And in fact, all of that I have been saying today, and in all my Vedanta talks, 
All of that is encapsulated in Om. All of what I say is basically an expansion of Om. You will say that. You could just say Om and then leave. That will be shorter. <laughs> but then nobody will understand what is meant. By. Yeah, if you want to know how Om is all of this, whatever we are learning in Vedanta, you have to go to the Mandukya Upanishad. Those who have heard this, Mandukya Upanishad, you know that Om encapsulates the entirety of the teaching. All right. I'll begin with, before we go into the practices, I'll begin with what's the point of it? What benefit did I get out of all of this? We started with the question, who am I? And the answer was that this consciousness. Our usual answer is, I am Sarva Priyananda. I am a man. I am an Indian. I am living in USA. I am brown and male. Now, if I ask you, this consciousness, awareness, which we saw, not the body, not the prana, not the mind, not the um, uh, intellect, not even the blankness beyond, and that consciousness in which all of these five levels appear, that consciousness, is it a man? Is it male? Consciousness, is it male? No, don't be hesitant, you're shy. <laughs> Just look inside. As I said, this is noticing yoga. Notice that awareness within. Is it male? Is it female? And then I'm from New York. In New York we have 23 genders. <laughs> I kid you not. If you Google it, legal genders legally recognized by the state of New York, 23. This consciousness is none of these 23 genders. And yet, other than this consciousness, there is no male, female or any of the 23 genders. This consciousness is not white or brown or black. That's physical. And this consciousness is not even human or animal. So that's body. It's not physical. It's not even subtle thoughts, feelings, emotions. These ones appear to consciousness. Consciousness is not physical or subtle. It's deeper than that. So this consciousness is not a gender. This consciousness is not a material substance, body, mind. And yet, this consciousness alone appears as all genders, as body, mind, as persons. This awareness, which we noticed, if you try to notice this awareness, which is, I, I, I'm always there as awareness, whether I'm thinking or not thinking, whether I'm seeing or closing your eyes, notice, always notice. Opening eyes, watching, am I conscious? Yes. Closing my eyes, not seeing anything. Am I conscious? Yes. Thinking. I'm conscious, of course. Not thinking. Yes. Even then conscious. So consciousness is always there. In all perceptions, in all thoughts, and in the absence of perceptions and thoughts. This consciousness, can it die? Some of you are saying no. Some of you are hesitant. Notice, death is physical. Death is the death of the body. <coughs> and death is an experience. It must be an experience because we are so scared of it. So we must have experienced this sometime in the past or even if we have not, whatever you believe, you, you are sure of it that death is going to be an experience. Probably an unpleasant and painful experience. Nevertheless an experience. And look at the paradox of it. If death is an experience, to have any experience I must be conscious. If I am conscious of the experience of death, then the body dies. But did consciousness die? There are a lot of scientific and philosophical questions involved here. I am setting them aside. But notice, in death of the body in no way implies the death of the experience in consciousness. This consciousness cannot die. 
This is what was promised at the beginning. Tameva viditva ati mrityu meti. Realizing that I am, is realizing this ultimate reality, one goes beyond death. What does it mean? When you realize I am that, I am that consciousness, you realize you are beyond death. You are the witness of the death of the body. It cannot die. Can this consciousness become ill? No. If the body becomes ill, the consciousness is the one which gives the experience of the body being ill. Healthy body, consciousness reveals. Ill body, sick, sick body, consciousness reveals. Recovery from sickness, consciousness reveals. Consciousness was never ill. Consciousness cannot be ill. Is this consciousness afraid? Without any input from the mind, just if the mind is not, you don't take hear the mind at all. Apart from that, consciousness itself, can it be afraid? No. This immortal consciousness which cannot die and cannot be afraid, does it want anything? Without any input from the mind, just think awareness. That awareness, does it want anything? Wants will come only when the mind starts chattering. But does the awareness want anything? Nothing. This awareness which cannot die, this awareness which is not afraid, this awareness which does not want anything, does this awareness hate anything, dislike, jealous of anybody or anything? Awareness in itself, without any input from the mind. Is there hatred, anger, jealousy? If there is in the mind, that will be revealed by consciousness. Consciousness itself, by itself, does not have hatred, hatred or jealousy or misery. So this consciousness, you the consciousness, you, it, it does not die, it cannot die. It cannot become sick. It does not become afraid of anything. It's never afraid of anything. It does not want anything. It cannot hate or dislike anything. This consciousness, I am. When? All the time. It's just that I don't recognize it. I was saying the problem is, in Advaita Vedanta, we don't recognize it, we don't notice it. The moment you notice it, you are that. I am that. Upanishad says, Tameva Viditva Atimrityu meti, Brahma Veda Brahmaiva Bhavati. The knower of Brahman is Brahman. Won't you realize that? You realize I am that. This is enlightenment. But why don't we notice that? Why is it so difficult? I said it's difficult. First reason is we're looking in the wrong place. Like Mullah Nasiruddin looking for the keys where the light is there. We're looking for it in the place which is most comfortable for us to look at. Where? Objective word. So anything that we want, we have found it in the objective world so far. So when we are told about Atman, Brahman, Consciousness, Awareness, True Nature, whatever it is, we again start looking. It can't be seen. Okay, it can't be seen, but it can be thought of, right? It can't be thought of. Then it doesn't exist. Object. It's not an object. That's why it's difficult to notice. And you, knowing that it's a subject is all that we need to know. Because you are it. An object can be lost, recovered and lost again. But the subject it can never be lost. Because you are it. Giving up this quest for objective knowledge of the Atman is enlightenment. I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. After hearing Vedanta, after understanding everything, after noticing, then you give up this quest for a further objective experience of Atman. That is enlightenment. Not because, oh, you can't know it, an agnostic approach. Not because of that. It's because it's more than known. Like Ananda Mahima said, it's more real than this. There's no need even to try to find out a way of 
objective. It's like looking at my face in the mirror and becoming anxious if the mirror is not there. Let me quickly get a mirror and, oh, my face is still there. Good, good. No, let me see again. We have no anxiety. The reflected face in the mirror depends on the real face. The real face does not depend on the reflected face. Not at all. We are behaving in such a foolish way as if my real face depends on the reflection. So as if I, the Atman, Brahman, awareness, the Tao, whatever you call it, that ultimate reality which I am, somehow it depends on some kind of experience that I can generate with my mind, then it's all. Right. No. Not necessary. Even the quest for that shows a kind of ignorance, a lack of this shakiness, this lack of certainty about who I am, what I am. The second reason, so this is the first reason why we um, don't notice it, why we find it difficult for enlightenment, because we are trying to do the impossible. But suppose you have a flashlight, with that flashlight you can see everything. Torch, we call it in the torch, the flashlight you can see everything. Oh, you can see everything. Then can I see the flashlight with the flashlight? Can I turn it around quickly? Flashlight light is coming from here. Good. Let me turn the light. By focusing the light, I can see different things. Now let me focus the light on the light itself. Quickly turn it around. No. You cannot do it. Not only you cannot do it, you need not do it. Light does not require more light to illuminate. That the unlit object requires light for illumination. Vidyarnya Swami, in the Panchadashi text, he says, um, by the way, I am now talking about the practices for enlightenment. I am talking about the highest, final practices which really cannot be called a practice. It's an insight. Then we will come down to more practical levels. But Vidyarnya Swami says, look at it this way. You add sugar to something that makes it sweet. There's a glass of water. I want to make it sweet. What do I do? I add sugar to it. I have coffee. I want to make it sweet. What do I do? I add sugar to it. Sugar plus water, sweet water. Sugar plus coffee, sweet coffee. Sugar plus something, sweet. Now in order to make sugar sweet, what do I do? Add sugar to it. No. It has its inherent sweetness. Okay, I get the point. But what, what are you trying to explain? <coughs> To know anything, what do I need to add to it? To know anything in the world, whatever, science, art, religion, myself, Vedanta, anything, what do I need to do? Add consciousness to it. I'm using the language of adding sugar. Consciousness plus X is giving me experience of X. Consciousness plus mind plus eyes and I look at you, I have experience of you. Consciousness plus mind plus ears, I listen. I have experience of sound. Oh. Consciousness plus mind plus taste. I put a cup of tea or coffee. I have experience of coffee. Consciousness is necessary plus instruments. Consciousness directly shining on the mind. Experience of thoughts, memories, ideas, desires. All of that is possible because consciousness shines. So add consciousness to it, you will know it. You will experience it. So what is the con condition of sweetness? Add sugar. What is the condition of experience? Knowing? Add consciousness. Then how to know consciousness? What is the way of knowing? Add consciousness. So will you add consciousness to consciousness? Just like sugar, you don't need to add sugar to sugar to make it sweet. You don't need to add consciousness to consciousness in order to know consciousness. The consciousness is what is called Swaprakasha. Self-luminous, self-revealing. Everything is dark in this hall. Switch on that light, everything will be revealed in that hall. So to know anything, to see this, this room, you need to switch on the light. But to know the light, light, do you need to switch on one more light? No. But even the light is not self-luminous ultimately, because the moment you close your eyes, the light is gone. For you. Eyes, the light reveals everything. Eyes are revealing the light. And the eyes and all the senses are revealed by the mind. Proof, the moment the mind, mind is inattentive. Your eyes may be open, ears may be there, you will not hear or listen, uh, see anything. Or if the mind falls asleep, in sleep, 
Our eyes and their ears and their everything is working, but no information is coming through. So mind is the light which reveals the senses. Senses are the light which reveals the external light. The external light, sun, moon and electric light reveals the world. But what is the mind revealed by? Consciousness, awareness, chaitanya, chit. So many words are there in Sanskrit. Bodha, chit, chaitanya, samvit. Pure awareness, pure being, pure awareness which you are, which we discover, which we are trying to notice. That reveals the mind also. That shining, everything else shines. By, that, by the light of that, everything here is revealed. It is the light of lights. Jyoti Rajyoti. Light of lights. In Sri Ramakrishna's Arati, Swami Vivekananda composed it. At the end we sing, Jyoti Rajyoti Ujala Ridhikandara. The light of lights shining in our heart. In our heart means at the core of our being, you are the light of lights. You don't need anything else to know that you are consciousness. It has to be pointed out, it has to be noticed and that's it, the work is done. However, let's get down to it now. Now the question of practicality comes and says, Swami, all this is very fine, but I hate to break it to you, you are making so much of an effort, but I have heard it many, many times already. <laughs> and, and no doubt I will hear it in the future also, but I really don't think I am enlightened. What's going wrong? Well, the first level and the highest level of practice, of answer to this question, why am I not enlightened? What can I do about it? First level is, listen carefully again. The highest level of answer. Shravanatevagyana. It's the conclusion of classical Advaita Vedanta. Knowledge, enlightenment comes through hearing. The, you know, the classic Tenth Man story, I've told it again and again. I won't repeat it. You know, the people who crossed the river and they thought their friend had drowned and they counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They didn't count themselves. So they thought the Tenth Man has drowned. And then a wise person comes and points out, you are the Tenth Man. He immediately realized, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I am the Tenth One. What more does he need except that instruction? What practice, what rituals, what beliefs, what bhajan, kirtan does he need to know I am the tenth one? Nothing. Except that instruction and understanding that instruction. That you are the tenth. Similarly, Advaita Vedanta says, what more do you need to become a Brahmakyani? Nothing except understanding tat tvamasi, that thou art. You see, is understanding enough? That doesn't seem to be right. All right. Then, I am not getting the benefit. Understanding um, should give me, you see, we are already promised. You will overcome suffering. You will attain peace and bliss. I am not getting peace and bliss. I have not overcome suffering also. Then what is the problem? Then this, this is, so the first level of suggestion for practice is the Shravanateva Jnana. Listen carefully again and again and again. Not working? Yes. Swami, we have been listening for 30 years, not working. Then the next level of practice is called Nididhyasana. Nididhyasana means stay with it. I will give you a short practice, there are dozens of practices. After having thoroughly, carefully understood Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, try this. In, in, where, where are the practices? There are practices in Aparoksha, Nubhuti, 15 practices are there. There are practices in Drik Drishya Vivek, 6 practices are there. And many other texts. But all of them basically are the same thing. Know what the truth is because you are the truth. And stay with it. Focus there. Stay there. There are different ways of staying there. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that um, keep the mind and the witness self and do not think of anything else. You are the witness awareness. Too much movement. Can we? So, if you settle down and know 
No, don't look at the world. Keep your eyes closed. A quiet environment without too much sound. Then, if you're comfortable, no sensations from outside. It's very comfortable here. It's not too hot. I mean, outside it's very hot, but the hall is not too hot, not too cold. Everything's fine. And then with an effort, turn the mind inwards. Focus on the breath, breathing in and out. And then, Notice that I am aware of the breath in this non-objective awareness. I am there, not the mind, not the ego, not the memories, drop all of that. I am this one consciousness, drop that also, that's also an activity of the mind, stay there. And when we stay there, you will notice it's not easy to stay there. You'll come out. If you intensively stay there, if you really make a proper effort of it and try to stay there, it might be possible for a moment or two moments, a little bit, to have an experience of samadhi. You will notice it as the deepest, most profound, meaningful silence you have ever experienced in life. Even that silence is not the reality. The reality is the witness of that silence. What I mean by that is, one gentleman was a follower of Ramana Maharshi for many years, brilliant man. So he said, he shared his most private experience with me. He said, the deepest spiritual experience I have had was in the Ramana Ashram. I used to go there, sit and meditate. So one day, while doing that, I was still had absolute stillness. I have never experienced anything like that. And after that also, it was so deep, profound, there was no problem at all. Never again would I have wanted to come out of that also. I came out and I have not been able to go back there. And is that all? I said, this is where Advaita Vedanta becomes useful. <clears throat> that deep stillness is the closest approach to Samadhi that you have experienced, I have told you. I told him. Now, what does Advaita say? Advaita says, you are that consciousness to which that, that deep silence appears. Notice, the silence was not there. It came, it went away. It stayed for half an hour, one hour. It went away. You are that consciousness to which the silence appeared. The depth, the utter stillness, the profundity of it. Not just a quietness. Very profound. Very meaningful. And you are the same consciousness to which that silence went away again and the world rushed back in. But the consciousness is that which you are. So in that deepest possible silence, hold on to one germ of knowledge that I am the witness of this silence. I am that to which this silence appears. And that one is ever silent. Mardukya says, Shantam Shivam Advaitam. This is Nididhyasana. Making that mind silent, yogic samadhi. And having the knowledge that I am the witness of this utterly silent samadhi samana, that is Advaitic knowledge. Knowing that it is the same consciousness which again illumines the restless budding mind, the mind which again comes back into action, the same consciousness. You are all right as consciousness. You are the same consciousness which cannot die, which has no fear, it does not need anything, it does not hate, dislike anything. That consciousness you are. So this is the second level of the instruction. First level, Shravana Teva Not satisfied? Nididhyasa. But here also, Sri Ramakrishna says, at best, for most people, 
if you can do it, this one which we spoke about, at best it will be what he called Unmana Samadhi. Unmana Samadhi means, he gave a very nice parable. In a village, there was this mongoose in India, a village. It had this long bushy tail. It would jump into its hole, little hole in the wall and would be quite snug there and happy. But some mischievous boys, they tied a brick to its tail. Now what happened was, because of the weight on its tail, the mongoose would slip out of the hole and fall back on the ground. It would try to jump into the hole, but it would again fall back. That's what's happening to us. The brick tied to our tail. What is the brick? The word. Samsara. World, that is pulling us back. So, one reason why we cannot realize that truth is because it's not an object. It is the pure subject. It is hidden. We are looking in the wrong place like Muldana Suruti. So, that's, that problem will be solved by Vedanta. It will point out where it is actually. Not there. You. That's what we did today. But there is another reason why we are unable to become enlightened. What one, uh, someone calls the Veiling Brilliance. There is a book on the Devi written by Devadatta Kali, an American gentleman living in, um, in Santa Barbara. He translates all books on the Divine Mother into English. But the name is so brilliant, it's called the Veiling Brilliance. What is the Veiling Brilliance? This. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thought. Emotion, desires, likes, dislikes, memories, goals, objective, veiling brilliance. Consciousness is you, you are right here, but veiled by this. The restless, continuous display set up by Maya. And we cannot escape this because the brick is tied to our tail. We come back into this. The Ishopanishad says, Hiranmayena patrena satyasya pihitam mukham. The truth, the face of truth is hidden by a golden disc. A golden disc. A golden plate. Hiranmayena patrena. What is the golden plate? This experience we are having now. It is hiding the face of truth. Where is the face of truth? By that very consciousness you are aware of this golden plate. But this golden plate also hides that very consciousness. It's like a cloud which hides the sun. You are able to see the cloud because of sunlight. But the sun itself is hidden by the cloud. For, by, for us. It's not that the cloud can cover the sun. The sun is so much vaster. You are so much vaster than this golden disk. By your light alone this golden disk is, being, uh, is shining. But it also weighs. So this how to overcome, how to penetrate this wave. This is where sadhana comes in. There are a whole range of sadhana and sanatana dharma. It's all meant to enable us. It's all meant to take the brick off from our tail. So that we can jump into our real nature and remain snug there like the mongoose. It's meant to remove the veiling brilliance, the golden disk. What sadhana? So now we will really now bring in everything that we left at the beginning. It is not differentiating from bhakti, differentiating from meditation. We did all that earlier, but now we have to bring them in. Not working all this, I am still not enlightened. The mind is unable to absorb this teaching. The mind is unable to absorb this teaching. This is a word called dharana. Sri Ramakrishna would listen to all these kind of Vedantic thoughts. He is sitting there listening. His comment was, you find it in the Kathamrita, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, his comment was, after a lot of Vedantic discussion, these words are good, but there must be dharana, assimilation of these words. He notices, pundits are discussing, sadhus are discussing, devotees are discussing, I am Brahman, not the body, not the mind, neti neti, jidananda, rupa, shiva, words. Words. At best, one or two moments of absorption, at best, unmana samadhi which I mentioned. But then the brick in the tail pulls them out again. Then again they will complain, I am not enlightened, what to do? So, absorption, the training in focus in absorption. Swami Vivekananda said, concentration is the means for all knowledge, not just spiritual knowledge. 
you want to study physics or chemistry, you want to learn art, you want to learn music, you want to be a sports person, focus, focus, focus. Focus of the mind and focus in life. Steadiness. Stay there. That focus, the ability to hold focus for a long time, that's a huge subject in itself. And that's, luckily nowadays people are giving a lot of focus on focus. Daniel Goldman, who um, who's well known for his work on emotional intelligence, but his latest concern is focus. He's written a book, Focus. He says, because of this digital technology which we have now, social media and all that, and we all have it in the pocket, uh, we are getting a very distracted generation. Young people, and now they are growing up into out of college into jobs. One sign of that, there's a new term, intermittent attention. You see that all the time. Here also. You have taken away your mobile phones from you, told you not to see, therefore. But otherwise, what would have happened? Suppose the rule was not there. Once in a while, the mind will do it. Take a look, take a look. Something may have come. Nothing has come. It's all useless. <laughs> take a look. Very take a look. And there's a whole program on, uh, on I think, PBS or somewhere, why this is so. This, we have been programmed to do this. This is like, there are brilliant engineers in Google and Facebook and Twitter and all, and their whole, the whole um, effort is how to control your attention. And they call it the attention economy. And we are being trained to pay more and more attention to the phone. It's a fascinating study. And there was a recent... Uh, documentary which made waves social dilemma or something? Yes. <laughs> Recent one? Yeah. Yeah. On how the social media is training us towards distraction, is capturing our attention. If it, it's like addiction. It is addiction. So if I don't look at my phone every few minutes, I feel uncomfortable. If I switch off my phone, I feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> Why? Why? Most of us here, except the very young people, we lived most of our lives without these phones at all. There is a why, very good reason why. But the why is money. Your attention translates into a, a, a revenue generated for these companies. So they want your attention. Anyway, spiritual life, very damaging, this kind of thing. So focus. In spiritual life, there must be a training of focus for that, a wide-ranging Practices are there. Not just today. From ancient times, they realized the power of focus must be developed. So, in Vedas, they are called, it is called Upasana. Upasana. We, it's a common word for Hindus. Upasana means worship. But special word in Veda, Upasana, upasana means meditation. The training of focus. Even in Advaita Vedanta, that Upasana, or allied term is yoga. What kind of yoga do I mean now? Not the yoga of knowledge, yoga of noticing. I mean the yoga of focus, which is what I call Patanjali's yoga, the yoga of focus. So you'll find in many Advaitic texts, it's puzzling how suddenly after teaching, you are that, you are Brahman, suddenly they will start Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyara. Where did it come from? Why? It's because in Nididhyasana, this technology of yoga is important. How to focus? The best technology of focus is yoga, meditation, yogic meditation. In the book Flow, Mihai Chikzen Mihai, who devoted his whole life here in the US to a study of attention, study of focus. In that book he says, I have studied the literature, worldwide literature, ancient, medieval and modern for insights on focus, how to focus. And I have not come across a better technology of focus than the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. He says that and he spends two, two pages there on, on what Patanjali Yoga Sutra is. So focus, meditation. And take up some method, method of meditation. Advaita Vedanta wants you to be able to hold on to focus. Stillness, physical stillness, Rhythmic breathing, breath stillness, don't practice it. No breath, no life. So it is, it is a good idea to breathe. <laughs> so keep breathing, but rhythmic breathing and then calming the mind down. Shutting the perceptions, 
eyes, ears, as, as far as possible, calming the mind down, quietness, focus, the ability to focus. There also there is a problem. The problem is, Swami, we have been trying to focus all our lives. I took Mantra Diksha and I have been trying to practice Deity meditation, Ishta Devata Dhyana and all, all different kinds of meditation techniques. Common complaint of all techniques, common complaint, mind is restless. Cannot focus. And it's an ancient complaint. In sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks Sri Krishna that uh, sixth chapter is a meditation chapter. And Arjuna asks, he says, you know, what you taught me, this yoga of meditation, it's useless. It's very straightforward, blunt, it's useless. Why? Because my mind is restless. Why you are dushkaram, sudushkaram? It's like trying to control the air, the wind. It's impossible. And then Krishna answers, it's not impossible, it's difficult. He admits it, it's difficult. Vairagyena shagriyate, abhyasena dukaunteya, vairagyena shagriyate. By systematic practice, morning and evening sit for meditation, and by dispassion, vairagya, dispassion for all the impulses coming up, coming from the world. Phone, now it's coming from the pocket. Take a look at me, take a look at me, phone is saying. No, vairagya, dispassion, I'm not interested. And that dispassion requires purification of the mind. This is where you have to untie the brick and get rid of the brick. Purification of mind is called Chitta Shuddhi. One very powerful practice for purification of mind is Bhakti, devotion. Remember, I'm not teaching Bhakti here, I'm not even teaching meditation here. I'm just teaching Jnana Yoga, noticing Yoga. But Bhakti is a very powerful purifier. When all the desires of the heart, whatever we want in the life, let's be honest, we want so many things, it could have all these, I would love to have all these things. And I know also at the same time they will not give me deep and lasting satisfaction. When all the desires of the heart are taken together and channelized towards God, it's the same consciousness. You read Advaita Vedanta, you see the same consciousness that I'm searching for, knowing that I am. That one appears as the God of the cosmos. When it is channelized towards God, towards my Krishna, my Rama, my Ramakrishna, my Jesus, in that way, what happens is, the mind is purified. Impurity in the mind, which leads to disturbance in the mind, which leads to lack of focus, which leads to lack of being able to stay there, which leads lack, to lack of in, not com comprehending what is being taught. That is due to impurities in the mind, desires in the mind, mind being pulled outwards. Just like the mongoose is pulled out of its hole. So, to bhakti. What is bhakti? It is same desire. Those things which are driving us to the world, same desire, collected and streamlined and focused, just the direction is changed. Direction is changed towards God. Bhakti. One very powerful practice for cleansing the mind. Another very powerful practice for cleansing the mind. Karma yoga. Transformation of our activities. I am doing everything in life for I, me, mine. Well, good, what's wrong with that? What's wrong is it's not working. I want to satisfy this one. It's not yet satisfied. Whole life I've been working for this. No satisfaction. Now let me use these activities by an action for the service of humanity. Selfless action. Could be for the service in the church. Could be for service in the Vedanta society. For in some... Um, uh, non-profit or in my field of work at home everywhere I am worshipping my Lord whether it is um, turning in a report in my office whether it's preparing for a class in, in school or cooking a meal at home it is all the same worship no work is too great or too little in the eyes of the Lord so they can all be karma yoga very powerful way of cleansing the mind removing the brick from the table Mind purified by karma yoga, all desires purified by focusing towards God, bhakti, then calmed and focused by raja yoga, upasana. That purified and calmed and focused mind, when we bring it to nididhyasana, it will remain, remain for long.
periods of time. Then we will have no doubt, when it will come out also, we will have no doubt that I am the ever free, problem free, peaceful, not afraid, immortal consciousness. Then on, another interesting thing will happen. You will realize that instruction, original instruction, you are that, that was enough actually. All of this process was to overcome the obstacles that we had put. They are called the, um, you know, the, the obstacles to the arising of enlightenment. All these practices are not for enlightenment. All these practices are for removing the obstacles to enlightenment. I remember in the Vedanta Society in New York, or you can apply the same thing here. Where is the church where the Vedanta talk will be? If you ask me here. So you are in it. Here you are sitting. No, how can that be? If you are not convinced, you have to put in a lot of effort to go to the church. And if you are not convinced, you go out. Take a left, there is a parking lot. You go to get your car, take a spin around the block, come back inside, park your car and come inside the door and turn into the hall and come and sit here. You are in the church in the Vedanta talk. All this effort was for convincing you that you are in the right place. We are in the right place. You are Brahman. These are in brief the sadhanas. Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga, all sadhanas leading to Jnana Yoga, noticing Yoga. And if you realize, you are Brahman. And the problem is solved. So if you some time for Q&A, just raise your hand and they will do we do it the way we did it yesterday? Yes, we'll come, we'll work our way this way. Yes, gentlemen here, please tell us your name and ask a brief pointed question. We'll go to you and then go to the gentleman in the back. One here and one here. That's it. And the lady here. We come to the lady here first. Shri Guru Pyanamaha Harihu. Swami Ji. So I am here because of my Puru Purva Prarabdha. When the Purva Prarabdha is coming to fruition, so we have, have taken this path and I go. When I go, you know, the, as in Garuda Purana it says you go through the Preta and then Linga Sharira. So the question I am trying to figure out is, how does, what is the relation of the Jiva with that journey. So who is getting attached? Because the jiva does not get attached here. So who is the one who is taking that path? Correct. The answer to this is a very nice example we use in Advaita Vedanta. Sun is shining out there. And in the garden you have, suppose you have multiple pots filled with water. In the pot there is water. In the water you will find a tiny sun is shining reflection of the actual sun. In every pot, water is different and the tiny sun is, is different. When the, then imagine the pot is the body, the water is the subtle body, sukshma sharira, pranamaya, manomaya, vijnanamaya, and anandamaya let's include it, the karma sharira. And the little sun shining in that water is the chidabhas, the reflected consciousness. Now when the pot is cracked, it's about to break, the gardener comes and pours the water into a new pot. Where what goes into the new pot? Old pot is broken and thrown away. It will not go to the new pot. But the water will go to the new pot. And the reflected sun also will travel along with the water to the new pot. Real sun does not travel. Advaita Vedanta says, just like the pot, physical body. Just like the water in the pot, subtle body. What is subtle body? The pranamaya, manomaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya. The anandamaya including its karan and causal body actually. And the, the little sun which is shining in that water is like the awareness which we have right now. Right now we all feel aware. So is this, if you ask, is this Atma? Is this pure consciousness? Is this Brahman? I am aware. This is Brahman? This awareness I have right now? No, it's the reflection. You just have to take that one crucial turn from there. What is the relationship between this reflected consciousness and actual consciousness? It's just like the reflected face in the mirror and the actual face. Water is like the mirror. The reflected sun is like the reflected face. Mind is like the mirror. 
or like the water. And the awareness in the mind is like the reflected sun or like the reflected face. As you turn away from the reflected face and notice that, oh, here is my real face. That is the reflection, here is my real face. Similarly, can you turn away from the awareness you find in the mind towards <coughs> nameless, you can't even name it, that which is being reflected in the mind. You cannot objectify it, you will only become it. Okay, to answer your question directly, what is traveling, what gets attached, what is seeking Vedanta, what has come for Vedanta, enlightenment also. It's not the real sun. It's not even the broken pot. It's the water in the pot which goes from pot to pot to pot. It is the Jivatma, which is, what is the Jivatma? Consciousness, the real consciousness which I am, plus my Sukshma Sharira and the reflected consciousness, Jidava So that's the Jivatma. That goes from bird to bird. Notice that the example is so nice. If the water is polluted in that pot, and you transfer it to a new pot, will the pollu pollution go with that new pot, uh, with the water? Yes, it will go. So we all, our samskaras from the past lives, they travel with us. We are the same person, the same Jivatma. But Advaita Vedanta is saying, no, no, no. You have nothing, you have nothing to do with the pot, you have nothing to do with the water, nothing to do with even with that reflected uh, sunlight. You are the sun. That is the meaning of Mano buddhya hankara chitta and not the mind, bottom, intellect, memory, mind, intellect, memory, ego, that is the water. The five elements making up the physical body, that's the pot. But chidananda rupa shivoham, that's the sun. People make a mistake. Yes, yes, all that I understand, but I am that little awareness in this mind, I have to go from here to the sun. No, you are the sun who is being reflected in that little awareness. This shift is a big shift. This is what Advaita Vedanta is trying to achieve. So it's, but at the level of your question, what is going from body to body, what is going from lifetime to lifetime, it's that water mixed up with so many things and with a little flash of light there from the actual sun. That is what is going. Swamiji, well, uh, two questions. One for, uh, as a follow up to your talk this morning. Can you say a little bit more about feelings and where they lie from the spectrum of senses to intellect to uh, self, mm. given so much of our experience changes based on feelings and yeah. vice versa? Feelings would be in the mind, Manas. Okay. And then the second question is, what is the purpose of life? The question, according to Vedanta, it might sound very audacious, but given, let's say it's God realization or Samadhi, I just want to make sure I don't feel like, is this it when I actually achieve that? How can we avoid that pitfall? What is the goal of life? God realization is the goal of life. Brahma Jnana, uh, enlightenment is the goal of life. Realizing who I am is the goal of life. That is the truth. I mean, realizing the ultimate truth, that is the goal of life. Um, or more in terms of what we are looking for. Attaining this deepest fulfillment and transcending suffering, that's the goal of life. Okay. Associated that with that, you ask the question, how do I know that, you know, make a mistake, a pitfall? Sri Ramakrishna says, one great danger in the path of knowledge, Jnana Yoga, what I call the path of noticing. And Sri Ramakrishna would be upset when I, if, if I make it so easy as path of noticing, as we just have to notice it. And that's the great attraction for the path of knowledge. Especially if you are a little intellectual, uh, it is a great attraction because first of all it promises to be instantaneous. All of the paths, long, long time, this is instantaneous. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhavunam Janma Namante, at the end of many lives of striving, not 10 years, 20 years, many lifetimes of striving, one attains to the realization, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, that Brahman alone is everything, Vasudeva is everything. Now, here in Jnana Yoga, it seems instantaneous. Oh, I have to realize something which I already am. That sounds very fast, immediate. Also, it sounds effortless. All other yogas, all other spiritual paths, so much effort is involved. So much painful, slow self-transformation. It sounds effortless. It sounds uh, instantaneous. In a certain sense, it is effortless and instantaneous. After all, it's you. And yet, 
for all the practical purposes is neither effortless nor instantaneous. Even to this, come to this point where you begin to appreciate and understand what Jnana Yoga is, it is preceded by lifetimes of effort. Only at this point, you're fortunate that, that we like it, that there's a liking for Advaita Vedanta. Um, Avaduta Gita says, Ishvara Anugraha Deva Pumsam Advaita Vasana. It's by the special grace of God that one has a liking. Let's give a bottle of water there. Now, simple metric of caution. So, Sri Krishna says that in this path there is a special danger. In this path. In Bengali, he says, Bhave hoye gache, maje maje hi paton. Bhari bhayanak. Things that you have already accomplished and then slips away again and again from that. This is so terrible. That is the special danger of this path. There is a special danger in every path. The special danger of this path is uh, thinking I am enlightened. So here is the criteria. It's much safer, even if you are enlightened, to think that I am still in progress. It's much better to be enlightened and think I am not enlightened. Rather than to be not enlightened and think I'm enlightened. <laughs> so let us take it for granted, it will go on. Uh, and we will keep doing our spiritual practices. Never stop. I, I love this Buddhist teaching, a Tibetan Buddhist teaching. It says, it is true upon enlightenment, it is true that you and your guru are the same. Never fail, after knowing that, never fail to. Um, to give respect and reverence to your Guru. It is true that the uh, city and the forest are the same from, from an highest realization, but never give up a chance for a retreat into the forest. It is true, with eyes open and eyes closed, it is the same reality, but never miss your meditation. So like that, seven warnings were there, I don't remember all of them. So this is good, this is a good caution. As long as it goes on. So, but then they, one would ask, then what is the point of all this? If I have to keep on doing my meditation, prayer, puja and all of that, then what did we do full morning? What is the, the advantage, is, great advantage is, if we have got it, what was talked about today. All our paths, the so-called progressive paths are, we have the idea, I am seeking, I am searching. I believe, I don't even know as yet whether it's the truth. I believe, I'm seeking, I'm searching. But if you have got what we have talked about today, then the great advantage is, I have found it. Now all my practices are now to stay there to deepen it. I'm no longer really seeking. I know what it is. That's a really great advantage. It's fantastic. After that you will never cease your spiritual practices. After that, you will never be in doubt also, after this. Never be in doubt that there is such a thing, and I am that. That's great. So hold on to the idea that I am still a work in progress. At least this person is still a work in progress. Brahma is not a work in progress, but this person is a work in progress. And let it go on. Let's, let's keep doing uh, whatever we can in spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Let's do karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and so on. The gentleman there. Namaste Swamiji, my name is Sri Ram. I'm a, it's a blessing to see you in person. I watched you over multiple years on YouTube. So make it a quick question here. Uh, so once I was just trying to, it was just a casual everyday life, you know, thing going on. And I was just, let me just be, try to be still and just notice. I wasn't looking for anything special or any kind of experience or anything like that. And suddenly I started realizing, try to be, Little bit still, I wouldn't say like yogic still, anything, just basic stillness, right? People are walking around, things are happening, I'm there. It's going on, I'm there. It, things are going on, I'm there. A few, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes later, I realize there was no time. It felt so bizarre, it's all, everything happened in the now moment. Right? Time was, and then I realized, my God, time is such a, it's so false. It's a completely made-up concept. 
A day in day out we sleep, there is a sun, there is the light and you alarm and work and traveling and you know time, 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 time rules our lives, right? It's, it, but the, it was such a visceral feeling, just that one and a half minutes, I can, I can't. I mean, every day then I mean, it's gone back to no quote unquote normal reality, right? So, I feel there are these ontological experiences like Vedanta points out, you can really see a small glimpse of the truth. And then obviously I've lost it again, right? That is, I, I'm not able to reproduce that experience or whatever, right? So, how do you, that Nidityatana, right? How do you hold on to the truth and drill it in? Like, like, like one of my uh, uh, spiritual classes I go, the teacher said, if I told you this is 50,000 volts of electricity, you wouldn't touch it, you, you believe it, you will die when you touch it, right? But we don't take that, that ultimate truth to that level of conviction, is it like deeper in the conviction, what is going to make it really real for me every moment? Thank you. Time is an illusion. It's, uh, when you're going like, oh no, how long will he go on now? He's already declared time is an illusion, so <laughs> uh, very aware of uh, the time passing by. But it's true. But let me give you a similar experience which a young monk reported. Um, he had got down in a station in Belur, near our main monastery in, in India. Then from the station he was going in a rickshaw, a local station to the monastery. And you can imagine, busy, small town Indian, the Howrah, the street, uh, rickshaws going and people and cows and the honking and dust. And suddenly the monk felt is absolutely still and all of this is whirling around him, around that awareness. Even the time that he had travelled in the train and has come and there is some time ahead of him, all that time is also passing before him. He is not moving through time. Time is moving. As people, as you said, people are coming and going, time is also coming and going. Space is also coming and going to that one still awareness. And slowly that thing faded away. Advaita Vedanta will say that glimpse, it's a glimpse. It has not faded away. It is the truth even now. And on that, this movie of the world is playing. When the movie is playing, has the screen faded away? No. It is just covered. That turn, the wailing brilliance. The movie is the wailing brilliance which wails the screen, movie screen. Time is the wailing brilliance. Time, space and causation. Desha, Kala, Nivitta, and another word, Maya. That's called Maya. It wails. But know that even when it's wailing, even when the movie is playing, that stillness is always there. Shantam, Shivam, Advaitam. Sa Atma, Sa It is ever peaceful, ever still. It is ever Shiva, auspicious. It is ever non-dual in the midst of all this duality. Then what, what, about, what, what do we do with that? Sa Atma, that's you. And you are always you. But again, saying all these things is very nice and good to hear this. But then you see, it will not be fully satisfying. How do I get to the level of Sri I mean, Maybe not that level, at least the level of a Jivan Mukta, for whom this is a continuous experience. Continuous experience means it's mediated through knowledge. I can't put it any better than saying mediated through knowledge. But for that, all these practices are necessary. Down to Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raj Yoga. Without this, this complaint will always be there. Even with experiences, even with glimpses, it still comes and goes. And unfortunately in my day-to-day -day life, it's not yet quite perfect, my response to this life. And that's the brick tied in our tail. Sri Ramakrishna saying this. The gentleman back there and the lady next to her.
consciousness. This experience does not belong to your consciousness. It comes and goes. And that helped me understand the world a little bit better and the experience it's having, having in this life. The question is, 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 is this lecture started the object and uh, object uh, in consciousness, two separate things. Uh, consciousness aware of object is the object is necessary and more subtle question is, is the right object is necessary. For example, we have the human body, we have the mind and intellect to think about these kind of questions, whereas the animals don't have that. So is the okay. consciousness plus right object is necessary for this kind of I have seen the question put in that way. Thank you for that. That's a very nice way of putting the question. Question is twofold. First of all, is the object at all necessary for the subject? Is an object at all necessary for consciousness? Second, is the right combination of consciousness and object? That means the right of consciousness is always right. But uh, object, the right type of object is it necessary? That means the right type of body, right type of mind, and is it necessary for enlightenment? Answer to the first question is no. Answer to the second question is yes. Is the reflection necessary for the mirror? No. Mirror is unconcerned with what you have a mirror. Something is being reflected in the mirror. Mirror is not bothered. It's not at all affected by the reflection. If a fire is being reflected, mirror will not melt. If uh, a lake is being reflected, mirror will not become wet. Angry man, a angry face being reflected in the mirror. Mirror does not become angry. No reflection, dark room. Mirror is still the mirror. So consciousness does not depend on the object. When we think about object and subject, consciousness and its object, it often seems consciousness is a pretty useless thing. Everything is being done by the object. Abhyavaharyam. Say the Mandukya Upanishad. Consciousness, Abhyavaharyam. Useless. But everything is done by nature, by the object. We think sometimes think that consciousness depends on the object. No, it doesn't. It's the object which depends on the consciousness. See, in your dream, lot of activities done by people and, you know, um, objects, the trains and cars and um, there's a body and the mind. Every action seems to be done by the dream objects and dream people. And yet, and the dreaming mind doesn't seem to be involved anywhere. But you know, it's the dreaming mind alone which is appearing as every object in the dream. So actually, the whole, all the objects depend on consciousness. But appearing, they seem to perform their separate roles. In a drama, theatrical performance, there's an emperor, an actor comes and goes to the green room and dresses an emperor as comes and delivers the lines. Uh, then goes back to the green room and dresses as a beggar and comes and delivers his lines. Now, in the theater, in the dramatic performance on Broadway maybe, the actor seems to be not there at all. So emperor, what are the characters? Emperor and uh, beggar. Nowhere in the list of characters will you find actor. But it's the actor who is coming as both the emperor and the beggar. Does the emperor, does the actor depend on the emperor and the beggar? No, they don't exist without him. Do they depend on the actor? Of course. Without the actor, no emperor, no beggar. Similarly, consciousness alone is independent. Everything else depends on consciousness. And... Uh, Second question, do you need the right combination of the object for enlightenment? Correct. That's a very concise way of putting uh, what is going on in, in spiritual life. That we need to put the body-mind in order, be purified, and do the yogas, so that this event called enlightenment occurs. All right. That lady there. How are we doing for time? Five minutes? Okay. Fifteen. Pranam Swamiji, my name is Mangana. It's been a blessing to meet you. Uh, my question is, as we go into more and more into Vedanta, you know, we keep hearing about the Brahman, and people like us that have also have bhakti more, very, you know, when you're in trouble, you think about your each devta. So when, as this knowledge comes, what are we praying? When, when there is, when something is going wrong, praying to an Ishta Devta is so much easier and more comforting than just praying and saying, I'm not the body, I'm not this mind, but I'm... Two levels. Means I understand I'm Brahman, 
But when I'm in trouble and I'm praying, whom am I praying to? But the moment you say, I am Brahman and I am in trouble, you mix two things up. Okay. Did we not agree? I, that awareness, that awareness cannot die. That awareness is, is not afraid. That awareness it has um, no uh, dislikes, hatreds. That awareness does not want anything. How can that awareness ever be in trouble? What trouble? So that is the advaitic side of it. But you see, I cannot deny that there is trouble and ups and downs in my life. Good. In that case, who is saying that? It is that awareness itself. But now, in combination with the mind and the body and the personality. So it's the person who is saying that. Vandana was saying, I have these problems and troubles in my life. The moment you are at the personal level, then that same awareness becomes the God of religion. And it's perfectly logical to pray to God from that perspective. It's also perfectly logical because that same awareness is still there. It's also perfectly logical to say, I am the witness of all of this. Both are true. As an impersonal awareness, witness of all of this, ever free of problems. As the personal, you know, Sarva Priyananda, there is the Lord, I am the serpent. Perfectly all right. Nothing illogical about it. Hanuman, uh, I often repeat this, Ramachandra asks him, what do you think of me? And Hanuman says, as this person, Hanuman, from the perspective of this body, I am the servant, you are my Lord. As this individual sentient being, you are the whole, I am your part. But as consciousness, as the self, you and I are one reality. Deha buddhya dasoham, jiva buddhya tvalamshaka. Atma buddhya tu tvame vaham, iti me nishchitamati. This is my conviction. He does not say it's contradictory. He says from different perspectives, they are all right. Swami Vivekananda. Uh, he gives the last word on this very beautifully. He says, um, when I am feeling fine, I say I am Brahman. When I have a tummy ache, I say mother. <laughs> And then he says to an American lady here, he says, Madam, always have two perspectives. Always keep, he says, always keep these two sides, these two sides, knowledge and bhakti, keep them together. It may sound contradictory, it's not contradictory. We are complex creatures. So both of them work for us. But remember, they are two different perspectives. When I am praying to the Lord, don't think, but Swami told me I am pure consciousness, Chidananda, Rupa, Shivoham. And then the Lord, when a Krishna or Rama will roll their eyes, oh God, here they go. <laughs> Don't confuse the two. See which one works. Be pragmatic. There's an American philosopher, William James. Pragmatism. So, which one works, you see? Both will work. Then the lady here. Swami, my name is Priyanka. I'm doing a PhD in artificial intelligence. Oh, all right. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I work on embodied AI, and in my quest for understanding intelligence and consciousness, I fortunately came across who am I video on YouTube. Wait, I can't hear what you said. Um, in so, the quest? Um, in the quest for understanding intelligence and consciousness, I came across your who am I video on YouTube. And I have to tell you, I was thoroughly fascinated by what you had to say. And I've been hooked to your lectures ever since. I have like a gazillion questions, but the question um, I want to ask you today is about the practice of Nishkama Karma. So for a long time, I've seen um, action as driven by one of two things, like the impetus to act in this world. Um, a, it's a desire to change the current state of the observable world. So A, um, it's the impetus to, under, to change the current state of the observable world or B, strong likes or dislikes. So, um, so when we talk of nishkama karma or desireless action, so um, if we remove the desire, one may be quick to jump to the conclusion um, that there is no action of it. No desire is like no action. Yet we see Nani's like Adi Shankaracharya, like traversing like the breadths and lengths of India, and Swami Vivekananda like crossing oceans to spread this knowledge. So my question is, 
How can there be intense activity in the midst of a notion of calm? And vice versa. At the level, very good question. I'll come back to your early introduction a little uh, later, but first answer to your question directly. In truth, in reality, no action. At the level of body and mind, you can have action or you can desist from action. See, as far as the body mind are concerned, is continuous movement. As long as we are alive, this body mind is alive, there will be action. The question is for what, impelled by what? If it's impelled by our individual likes and dislikes, we will be caught in samsara. If the likes and dislikes are impure, if they are gross, if they are, um, um, you know, we might even use the word sinful, then we will be caught in a bad kind of samsara. If the likes and dislikes are purified, I want to do good to others, I want to do spiritual practice, uh, all of that, then we will we'll still be in samsara, but I will be caught in a better kind of samsara. However, when we look at the awareness, the witness consciousness, remember I asked you some questions, can it die? No. It's the witness of the event called physical death. Does it, is it afraid? No. It cannot be afraid of anything. Does it want anything? Without any input from the mind, if you see the awareness, does it want anything? No. Does it hate anything? dislike anything. Without any input from the mind, if we look at the awareness, if we consider, no. I should have asked one more question. Does it act? Does it do things? No. It's like being in a dream. A lot of things happen in the dream. When you wake up, you have to truly say, nothing really happened. In spite of experiencing lots of things happening. Similarly, consciousness, in consciousness, lots of things happen. And yet, the consciousness itself is beyond karma beyond any action. So from that perspective, there's no karma. And from that perspective, when the body-mind engages in karma, it's called nishkama karma. So the body-mind can be fully active. And in truth, the jnani can claim, I don't do anything. Often in literature, in the Vedantic literature, you come across the jnani saying, I do not do anything. And yet the person is very active. Like Shankaracharya, as you said, went across the length and breadth of India. As Vivekananda crossed the oceans and came here. So an enlightened person, all the enlightened masters in all religions, most of them have been very active people, very few are lazy. <laughs> so at the level of body, mind, full activity. But in reality, I, the witness consciousness, there is no question of any activity there. I am perfectly always, by nature, I am very lazy. <laughs> Brahman is always the most lazy. Doesn't do anything. So that's the philosophical answer to your question. Going back to your quest for artificial intelligence, you see, Vedanta can contribute so much, I feel, at the level of the philosophy of mind or even the philosophy of AI. From a Vedantic perspective, intelligence and consciousness are different because consciousness and the Vidyanamaya Kosha are different. So, from a Vedantic perspective, is AI per Possible? Certainly, it's possible. Because artificial intelligence is a construct. It can be artificially constructed also. What nature has given us, artificially you can repl replicate that. But is consciousness possible? Will those AIs be sentient? Never. <coughs> Today I read a New York Times article. Why do scientists think that AI is sentient? It's a very nice article. There's no possibility at all. Why they think it's sentience is because sentience is not understood clearly. It, that's why I say Vedanta can help. Consciousness and, and AI are different. So thing can be, can be strong AI without being aware. But why do people confuse the two? Because without knowing the distinction between the two, when you see an AI system in action, one can easily be confused. Because it seems to be doing everything else other people are doing. Especially more and more. Priyanka and her tribe, they are coming up with all these smart machines which are doing things so similar to what we thought only human beings could do. They not only play chess, they can drive cars now in San Francisco. All these driverless cars, many of them going around. Usually there is a driver sitting in front, it's not so weird, not touching the wheel but sitting there. And the driverless car is going around and there is all this equipment on the top. Radar, and what LIDAR I think they call it, it's like on top. And the most weird is when there is no passenger, no driver and the car is going along. 
and they said, those were drivers. They said, that really freaks us out. How do you behave with this thing which pulls up next to you? Nobody there. <laughs> so, artificial intelligence is doing all the things we thought human beings could do, except one. Even when it's behaving in the most intelligent way, there are artificial intelligences which are doing uh, uh, creativity. We thought at least creativity is our thing. Painting, writing a story, artificial intelligence is painting and writing stories also. Sometimes rubbish, but sometimes good enough. So good that two, a human being cannot distinguish this painting done by a human being or an artificial intelligence. I was given, I have shown that in NYU recently. A series of paintings. Find out which is by human beings, which is by our AI. All of us, the whole audience, we couldn't find out. Even stories. Google Translate, doing a much better job. 10, 20 years back it was not able to do, but now it's doing a very smart job. So artificial intelligence is doing all the things we thought human beings only are capable of doing, including higher order creativity, to some extent it's possible, but it is not conscious. It, that does not mean that it is aware inside. Only you are aware inside, only I am aware inside. Living beings are aware because of that, Reflection of consciousness in the mind. All right. Hey, I'm Swamiji. My name is Mahadevan. So, two questions. Can you give some more examples of, you said I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, it's all very clear. I'm not the intellect. Is there any examples that you can give more? That is one. Second, for me to be aware of myself, I certainly need the body, mind, everything. Without this, I can never be, and we say that we are not that. So how do we address that paradigm? We are that. You say, but whole lecture you said, Swami, I am not that, not the body, now you are saying you are that. Imagine you have a, you have, in, in your dream you have a body, you are walking around, you don't feel I am bodiless. In a dream you don't say, oh my body is sleeping in the bed, I am just dreaming here. No, you feel I have a normal body like everybody else. But, um, when you wake up, you realize, I was not that body. My real body was sleeping on the bed. But what was that body? It was an appearance of my own mind. It was nothing other than me. In the same way, it is true that I am not the body, not the mind. But the body and mind are nothing apart from me, the me, Brahman. That Sadhu Nuttara can put it so beautifully. I'll tell you. You understand Hindi? Yeah. I'll, I'll translate for everybody. He said, Drashta to drishya se alag hai Mahatma ji, lekin kabhi aapne socha hai drishya kya drashta se alag hai? What you see, the object is certainly different, but you are different from the object. You are different from the object. Drishya is the object. I am not the object, I am consciousness. But have you ever thought, is the object different from you? You are different from the dream, no doubt. You exist without the dream also. But is the dream different from you? No, the dream is your appearance. You are appearing as the dream. So body, mind are our appearances. That question, you know, that question comes when we regard body, mind as real, consciousness as real. And Advaita doesn't do that. Sankhya does it. And Sankhya will answer yes to your question. Does consciousness depend on body, mind? For every functionality, including doing anything in the world, listening to a Vedanta lecture, becoming enlightened, for all of that, consciousness depends on body, mind. Does body mind depend on consciousness? Yes, for first person experience. That is Sankhya. Advaita says, no, no, no. Body mind is entirely dependent on consciousness for existence. Because consciousness, the body mind is nothing other than consciousness. Now you say, but we require all that for self awareness. Yes, but all that is you only. So you alone generate all that and give yourself those experiences from Advaitic perspective. Um, the last question is from the lady here, and we'll stop. Namaste Swamiji, my name is Vani Rao from Houston. In our tradition, when you seek with a pure heart, the Guru appears. Is it sufficient that you appear on YouTube, or do I need someone in person? <laughs> Good question. Yes, so many people ask this question. So, you know, I'll just tell you in our tradition. Uh, we all, in our tradition means in Ramakrishna Vivekananda tradition, in Vedanta tradition also. Uh, guru is necessary. And YouTube guru, is it sufficient? No. 
I can only create the taste for it, I can trans transmit these teachings. But if you ask me, is it absolutely necessary to have a separate guru? That also I must be honest, it's not absolutely necessary. But if you ask me for a practical recommendation for spiritual life, what is necessary? Uh, I will say mantra diksha is necessary and a guru. So in our tradition we have a guru who gives the mantra diksha, who will teach you how to meditate, do upasana, meditation. And of course with that you have the Vedanta teachings, whether from books or YouTube or whatever, you have that. So that's a more, that's a more complete approach for to sadhana. Direct recommendation, please get Mantra Diksha. If you already got it from some tradition, excellent. If you have not, here uh, our Vedanta Society, Vedanta Center of, uh, uh, of uh, Austin can tell you that uh, they organize Mantra Diksha here at least once a year or twice a year, once a year, not in COVID times, but now it will be there. Swami Sarvadevanandaji comes from the Vedanta Society of Southern California and offers Mantra Diksha here. It is my, like, my, a working recommendation to you. If anybody is seriously interested in spiritual life, one should take Mantra Diksha. Um, if you have a natural question, so how about you? Can't you give us Mantra Diksha? You can give it to us right now here and you'll be all done. No, I cannot. I am not empowered to do so. Only a few senior Swamis they do that. I give the Vedantic teachings, but you need Mantra Diksha. Uh, please uh, arrange and take Mantra Diksha. Sarvadevanji is there, and of course other senior Swamiji, Swami Chetanandji is there in uh, St. Louis, uh, Tyagananandji is there in Boston, Yogatmanji in Providence and so on. So you should take Mantra Diksha, that's my recommendation. On that action point, <laughs> study Vedanta, repeat the Ishta Mantra, do Karma Yoga and uh, path of spiritual life, you will be firmly at least moving in the path of spiritual life. That's the minimum we can do. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupa Namastu